Well, good evening and welcome to all who are joining us for this very exciting conversation tonight uh, with my favorite journalist, Yamish Alcindor. So welcome, Yamish. It is such a pleasure to have you here. Um, I'll say something else about you in a minute, but I want to give special thanks uh, to Dr. Jamal Watson for organizing this. Um, Dr. Watson is the uh, director of our journalism and media studies program and also our strategic communications master's degree, and he is just uh, an all round wonderful member of our faculty and so creative. So thank you, Jamal, and thank you, Miriam. I know you'll speak in a minute. Um, and Yamish, I just want you to know how proud all of us are of you. I'm just meeting you for the first time, but I'm a Georgetown alum also. So, so the Georgetown, the Hoya uh, connection here is great, law school, um, but also um, as a wonderful, strong woman, uh, in journalism. And uh, for a long time, I watched you at the White House press conferences and I kept saying, you go girl. I mean, you are so strong. And um, even for someone as old as I am to see a, a woman holding her own in that kind of environment um, is inspiring. And it makes me say, well, stop being, you know, so weak, stand up and say your piece. And, and you, you have. Um, so I'm very grateful to you. I love seeing you on Washington Week. Um, and I know you were on Trinity's campus recently talking about our balanced pay down program. So we're glad that we were able to welcome you then. I missed you then, but it's so good to meet you tonight. So thank you for being part of this. And, and I see that we have almost 100 are joining us. So um, a big audience for you tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here, um, President McGuire. I'm I'm uh, I'm happy to hear that you're a Hoya as well. I have a <laughs> strong connection to to Trinity because yep. I, I told Jamal this. I'm in a sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, which oh, okay. is the same sorority as the Vice President. Um, right. Our sorority, our charter is Georgetown Trinity and Catholic. So okay. I have nine <laughs> sisters that went to Trinity. I spent a lot of time on your campus when I was there Thank doing you. the story a couple of weeks ago. I I almost didn't recognize Trinity because it's gotten so beautiful and so modern and it was beautiful before but these new buildings <laughs> popping up everywhere it feels like Georgetown I go back to Georgetown and I can't recognize where I am anymore so right. it's great to see higher education just learning and, and growing mm -hmm. and it's and it's a great story that I'm so excited to tell about the program about that your university did paying down those student fees yeah. there's there's it's such an incredible impact and we're going to tell that yeah. story so I'm excited to to tell that story thank you so much it's great thank you Thank you, President McGuire. I now want to introduce Miriam uh, to introduce uh, our speaker. Miriam. Thank you, Dr. Watson, President McGuire, and thank you to everyone who is present with us this evening. My name is Miriam Barcenas, and I am a junior at Trinity Washington University, majoring in journalism and media studies with a minor in Africana studies. And I'm honored to have been invited to introduce our special guest and moder moderator. Yamish Elsinder is the White House correspondent for the PBS News Hour, the moderator of the PBS weekly public affairs show, Washington Week, and a political contributor for NBC News and MSNBC. Throughout her career, Elsinder has told stories that focus on the intersection of race, politics, as well as fatal police encounters. She currently covers the administration of President, o President Joe Biden and the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Yamish Alcindor gained notoriety for her courageous work in covering former President Donald Trump's administration as she focused on the impact of his policies and rhetoric on vulnerable populations domestically and internationally. As a White House correspondent, she covered a range of issues, including the dis disproportionate impact of the coronavirus on Black people and communities of color, the protests following the death of George Floyd, and the consequences of former President Trump's immigration policies. Previously, Alcindor worked as a national political reporter for the New York Times and a national breaking news reporter for USA Today. In 2021, she was named the recipient of Radio Television Digital News Association's John F. Hogan Distinguished Service Award, the International Women's Media Foundation Gwen Ithil Award, and the White House Correspondents Association Aldo Beckman Award for overall excellence in White House coverage. Alcindor is 
a member of the National Association of Black Journalists and was named the organization's 2020 Journalist of the Year. She earned a master's degree in broadcast news and documentary filmmaking from New York University and a bachelor's degree in English, government, and African, stud African American studies from Georgetown University. A native of Miami, Florida, Yamish is married to a fellow journalist and the daughter of Haitian immigrants who met while attending Boston College. Our moderator tonight is my professor, Dr. Watson, Jamal Watson. He is a veteran journalist and is the chair of the Journalism and Media Studies Program and the director of the Strategic Communication and Public Relations here at Trinity Washington University. Let's welcome them both. Thank you so much, Miriam, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so excited to be able to engage for the next hour or so with Yamish. Two things. One is I want to invite all of our audience members, if you have a question, to put your question in the chat box, and we'll try to get to as many as possible uh, before the hour is over. I also want to acknowledge that this is the first in our 2021-22 lecture series. Um, some of the past guests that we've had here at Trinity include Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, Reverend Al Sharpton, Ilyasa Shabazz, who is the third daughter of Malcolm X, and Dr. Betty Shabazz. And for all of you who are attending, I want you to mark November the 2nd on your calendar because we're going to be proud to welcome Dr. Cornell West, who will be joining us as part of this lecture series. But again, excited to have Yamish kick this off uh, tonight. So welcome, and by the way, she is my fellow Hoya uh, sister as well, uh, went to Georgetown University as well. So welcome, glad to have you. I am uh, teaching a graduate course this semester uh, focused on multicultural media history, and we're focusing in the class on folks like um, Alice Dunnigan and Ethel Payne, who I'm sure you know, Ethel Payne was one of the early uh, White House correspondence. I actually wrote my dissertation on Ethel Payne and her role in the Black press. And I was wondering, can you talk about where we've come in terms of Black people and particularly Black women covering the White House? Uh, because at one time, there were really none. Uh, now there's yourself, there's April Ryan, there's a few others. But where, how would you assess the, the, the landscape and where we are with regard to, to that? Um, well, thank you again for having me tonight. I'm really, really excited to, to come to Trinity. I, I feel like it's a second home. So I'm, I'm just very, very excited to be here. Um, and I think it's a good question about where have Black women in journalism come um, in all of the different years. I think that when, when I think about the way to answer that question, I think the first thing is that um, we're still sort of on our way to, to where things should be. Um, there was a time where you could be told simply you are black or you are a woman, therefore we will not hire you at a newspaper or on TV. No one can say that to you to your face anymore. Um, we now are in, in a space where after we've had some pioneers in black women, Al Sungingham, as you, as you said, and others who covered the White House, we're now in a place where there are at least a handful of black women in the press briefing. I'm thinking of myself, April Ryan, Aisha Rasko, Darlene Superville, um, Kristen Welker. So there are a few of us that are that are covering um, the White House now, but it's still overwhelmingly, I would say, a, a press corps that is white and that is male. So I think that in some ways, newsrooms are think still really are trying to wrap their heads around what diversity looks like, how important it is to have diversity. Um, we're seeing a lot of, I would say, uh, and I should I mentioned black women, but I think there are a lot of black men that probably also should really be uh, deserving. I think of Tolu who used to cover um, the, the White House for the Washington Post. And right now there's Zolan who's covering it for the New York Times as an African-American male. Um, so, but still we're, we're, we are the absolute minority um, of minorities in the White House briefing room. So it is, I think, a, a testament to the fact that we are a nation that is still growing. Um, it's still trying to get better, but that really has some work to do. And I'll just say in terms of the black press, um, you know, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I started and I always remind people the first person who ever gave me an opportunity to write a story, the first place who ever said you can come and be a journalist was a black newspaper, weekly newspaper in South Florida called the West Side Gazette. They took me with no experience. They took me when I was 16 years old. They took me from a curious teenager into someone who understood what it meant to, to write a nut graph, what it meant to, to, to know AP style. 
they were my first training ground and they were people who told me you can do this you can be confident enough if this is your dream to be a journalist you can do that and i went on to work at all these great places but i never forget that the west side gazette in my in my hometown was the place that gave me my first shot because it is i think such a reminder that the black press and black organizations in particular i'm i'm as, as you mentioned a member of the national association of black journalists they sometimes black journalists sometimes are the first people to look at other young young black people and say, you can do this. And I, and I, and I make it a point to, to, to reach out to young people who are inspiring in journalism, but particularly people of color, because we as, as a community are still very, very much under, underrepresented in the media. Uh, the last survey I saw said something like the media was 3% black. It tells you that we have a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. And it, it also makes me think about the mission of Trinity in terms of training uh, particularly what young women of color to begin to enter into this profession, um, which I think is so critically important. And I was going to ask you how how you, how do you assess kind of where we are in terms of efforts being done to diversify the newsrooms? Obviously, we've been talking about this issue for for decades, right? Um, the need to diversify, the need to recruit uh, and retain individuals in newsrooms at the highest at the highest level. Uh, but obviously we're not doing that well, right? I mean, and, and what can be done in order to make that um, reality, you know, more, more feasible? I mean, I think it's, it's a great question. I think there are a number of things that can be done. I think the first is that, you know, we need to shift this idea of, 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 um, having people that have so much experience get internships. So I, I was looking at a, a tweet by Sam Sanders. He's a host at NPR. And he was saying, well, he was tweeting out sort of the the, the skill sets that were needed in internships. In some ways, it's like we need to recognize that there's going to be a population of students that need their first that they need their first break. And I think that in some ways it, it needs to be sort of part of the, uh, an organization's culture. If you wanna hire young people, if you wanna train them, be willing to really train them and understand that some people, especially someone like me who came from a single parent household who could not take free internships, I had to make sure that I was both earning money and also trying to gain the skill sets to be a journalist. So I think in some ways we really need to rethink what internships look like. I'm a huge advocate of paying interns because I really do think that the people who can afford to work for free, they're in a, they're in a different bracket. I can say, just say that for myself. I was, I was, it was very rare. I took one unpaid internship and it was really, really hard because I had to work like two jobs in college to make up for the time that I was spending in this free internship. So I think it really is one opening the door so that there is this level playing field. So we're, we're, we're we are paying people a living wage when they're coming to study and, and work on journalism. I think the other thing is to really talk about the mentors that we have and to also be hiring and promoting people of color so that you don't just have black journalists in newsroom, but you have black managers, you have black managing editors, you have have black editors and chiefs. Um, that to me is something that is very critical. I think of Dean Bake at the New York Times, an African American man, first African American man to be editor in chief of the New York Times. I was working at, at USA Today. I was a national political reporter. I had covered Trayvon Martin. I had got kind of gotten some some attention, and people were saying you have some great skills. Dean Bake looked at me and said, "You know what? You're ready to cover the 2020, 2020 2016, I should say, 2016 election." I was sort of surprised myself. Like, can I cover politics for the New York Times? And he said, "Yes, you can, and you will." So I think that that it's also about making sure that we there are people in place that see people of color and see them as possibilities. One of the, the best things I heard um, recently, I forgot who was saying it, but there's this real opportunity gap. There are people who look at people of color who might be struggling and, and can't see the possibility that they might see, frankly, in a white male or a white woman. And I think that we need to shift that, that paradigm um, and give people some room to really grow. So I think that the, there has to be structures in place to really value diversity. It can't be sort of something that people put in pamphlets and it's an afterthought. It has to be, okay, we're buying notebooks, we're getting a, a building, we need a diverse staff. It has to be that ground level because you can't cover journalism. You couldn't have covered the last four years without a diverse staff accurately. I, I don't understand how you cover the pandemic without 
really having a, a need in your newsroom for diversity without having, without having a diverse set of, of people around the table talking about politics, talking about um, all of the different things that are happening. And I should say, when I talk about diversity, yes, of course, race is really big, but I also think it's about gender. I also think it's about socioeconomic. It, I think it's also about geography. I'm married to someone whose family is from rural Virginia. So I spend a lot of time now, I spend a lot of time in sort of very rural areas that don't have broadband. I would not have understood the, the sort of real need for broadband if I didn't have in-laws who, when I literally go visit them, my cell phone doesn't work. I think it, it and I'm thinking of my nephew who's growing up in, in, in that community thinking, okay, well, how, how is he going to have the same opportunities as a kid living in DC if he can't even get to the internet, if his cell phone doesn't work when he gets home? So I think that there is sort of, when we talk about diversity, it also has to be a real diversity, not just, okay, I hired a bunch of people that look a little different. It has to be, do they have a, diver, a diversity of experiences? I'm an East Coaster. I grew up in Miami, then I went to school in DC, and then I lived in New York. So there, I think there should be people that also are from the middle of the country that are from other parts of the country. I think that that, the, the, so I say all that to say, I think that the understanding of diversity and what diversity means also needs to be expanded. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. When, when did you realize growing up in Miami that you wanted to be a journalist? I mean, you talk, to, you talk about writing for this newspaper at the age of 16. What, what was the moment for you where you said, this is, this is really what I want to do as a vocation? Yeah, I mean, the moment was, um, I was 16 years old and I learned about the story of Emmett Till, who was this 14 year old, was murdered in 1955 in Mississippi by a group of racist white men. Um, and his mother had this open casket for him. And I learned about Jet Magazine and what the image of Emmett Till meant to the nation and how it shifted so much. The March on Washington was on the anniversary of Emmett Till's murder. John Lewis gets inspired to be in civil rights because of Emmett Till. Rosa Parks starts get, gets, in, gets, gets motivated by the story of Emmett Till. He was a young boy who shifted the consciousness of America. And he did that because journalists turned their cameras toward him and decided we're going to print this photo. We're going to give his mother the sort of attention that she deserves after she made this courageous decision to open up this casket that showed a disfigured son of hers that had been murdered. So to me, that really clicked for me. It clicked for me what media could do, what journalism could do. I'd always been a writer. I've loved being writing sort, sort of since I was in third grade, writing poetry and short stories. But finally, it was a point where it's like, okay, I can take my writing and I can I can also marry it with this idea of social justice and, and civil rights reporting. And by the way, I can get paid because again, I have to tell you as someone who was raised by a single mother, when I was graduating from college, I knew I needed to pay my rent. Right. I didn't want to go home and, and not and not be able to sort of pay my bills. So there was also this I, this this real recognition that I needed to find a career. I loved poetry, but I didn't see poetry as being, you know, I could maybe I could have been Maya Angela or Nikki Giovanni, but I'll never know because I was like, I need to make sure that the, what I get into also has a real a real sort of financial benefit to it, um, to be to be frank, and that that was sort of the avenue I took in journalism sort of really, I think, meshed all of those things. Yeah. So you start writing for print publications and then eventually you make the pivot to 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 broadcast. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, because that's I mean, some people do it, but it's, it's somewhat unusual. Right. I mean, it's not happening all the time where print reporters then switch over and become uh, broadcast journalists. So can you talk a little bit about that process, what that was like and whether or not you encountered any cha challenges at all as you were trying to move from writing for USA Today, uh, the New York Times, to then appearing uh, on television. Yeah, I mean, I think it was it was definitely challenging. I got lucky that I got recruited into a TV job. The PBS News Hour said, "Hey, why don't you come be our White House correspondent?" It was an amazing opportunity, and I took it, and I was really, really excited about it. Um, it was definitely challenging. It's a lot different to 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 report on TV to say your story rather than write your story to have a thousand words versus two minutes to explain what's going on. So I definitely think it's a challenge. And I'm a very new anchor. I've only been anchoring since May, so learning how to stack a show, learning how to figure out what sound I want in the show, learning how to figure out which reporters I want around a table. Um, those are things that I'm still learning. So in some ways, I would say the transition is still continuing, but I've been lucky to have such great, I have, I've had great producers, great mentors who have really helped guide me and help me understand TV. And I still love writing. So I still write sometimes, um, but it, it, it is a great, thing to be able to sort of switch into this other mode. And I think in the next, you know, in the next, when I think about the next 
four years or the last four years, I think it's a TV, there's a, there's gonna be a TV quality to it. I think when we think about the Trump era, when we think about January 6th, people are gonna wanna see what happened. So I feel lucky and, and, and blessed to be able sort of in, to be in the visual medium to show people what's going on. Um, I also think that, it, that for me, you know, I've had a lot of friends who went from print to, to TV and, and that's also helped me. So I think about Abby Phillip, I think about April Ryan who went from radio, now she's into TV. So it's also become a lot, a, a somewhat easier because there are a lot of uh, print reporters who end up on TV, both at Washington Week or on CNN or MSNBC. So it's been, it's been a great transition, not without challenges, but definitely I think a fun one. Yeah, and Joy and Reed too, right? She yeah. Was a- she was a print uh, journalist. And Jamel Hill. I mean, there are a lot of them. Yeah, so there. So, <laughs> I think so, Stephen A. Smith. There are a bunch yeah. of them. I mean, sports and, and politics. Yeah. So, but PBS is has a particular brand, right? It's a different kind of uh, network. And the show that you do is a different kind of show. I think you can go a little deeper. Can you talk a little bit about kind of that form of journalism, which is a little different, I think, than some of what we see in cable news and, and, and other places? Well, I'll say if, if you're asking about news hour, I mean, news hours, our stories are longer. So I would have, you know, where, where if you were working for a, a sort of a, a 30 minute network broadcast, you might have a minute and a half, two minutes to, to tell a story. I often get six minutes, seven minutes to tell a story. So I think we have sort of mini documentaries on PBS news hour each night, where even today I was, I, I did a story about um, the special, the former special envoy to Haiti. Um, he was testifying publicly for the first time since he resigned from the post. And I was able to do a minute and a half setup and then do a four minute interview. That's a lot of time on a story like Haiti, um, which isn't as, I mean, it's still in the news, but on a day like today, when there's a debt ceiling and all this other stuff to juggle, um, it's a, it's a great place to be able to work and, and to sort of have that international, uh, international take. I also think on news hour, you're always going to kind of find offbeat stories. So we're always going to do, of course, stories of the day. So, you know, the president, he was, he's withdrawing from Afghanistan or, you know, we brokered a deal on, uh, on infrastructure or, or whatever, whatever the top news stories are. It's probably the first 30 minutes of our show but then the next 30 minutes it's a sort of you can talk you might have a, a deep dive on climate change or seven minutes on ethiopia or seven minutes on on space so i really think for 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 me i think the pbs news hour we bring you the cable vibe in some ways because we'll have republicans and democrats on debating important issues but we also will take you sort of behind the scenes and give you some of the stories that you might not see so the story even the story i'm working on with, that include involves Trinity. It's about student loans. It's about student debt. It's about sort of the financial challenges that students are facing during the pandemic. That story might be really, really hard to get on somewhere else, but for us, we're taking the time, we're taking weeks to put it together. We're interviewing people. It's probably gonna end up being six to seven minutes, which is a lifetime in TV, but it's gonna be sort of great. When it comes to Washington Week, which is sort of a different kind of beast, I think, what you get from that show is that you have reporters who you probably are a little familiar with emptying emptying their notebooks. It's, it's sort of our Friday night. Let's grab a beer. You know, we, we're not drinking on TV, but it's sort of let's grab a beer. What would I be asking you at the end of a long week at a dinner table? That's the vibe that I'm going for. And I think what's special, of course, about Washington Week is you'll have the top White House correspondent from CNN talking to the top White House correspondent from CBS, talking to someone from NBC who then will have a New York Times reporter. It's a collection of people that you won't see anywhere else on TV. You will never see on TV the top White House correspondent from one network talking to the top White House correspondent from another network. So I think it's really, really a special place. I kind of think of us as Switzerland. People come, they allow their, their correspondents to come on air. It's a, it's a very, I think, respected brand, 54 years old. It's a Peabody winning um, show. So for me, I think it, it, I'm lucky in that as a millennial, I inherited and got this amazing seat um, that is both something that I can make my own and be fresh and be new and bring new people on, but also has this amazing storied legacy with loyal viewers. Yeah. And, and allows the deep analysis to take place, right? So you can yeah. go a little deeper, which, you know, I, I guess counters the kind of narrative that we often hear which is that people don't want that kind of nuance reporting. They want the quick stuff right away. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I'm curious to know your take on that. You know, um, you having also worked for a publication like USA Today, where the stories are very, very right, tight and concise. Um, so I was wondering, this is almost like the, the opposite extremes to some degree, right? 
Well, it depends because I mean, I got lucky at USA Today that I ended up doing a lot of feature stories. Okay. So I, I, I regularly had sort of long feature stories that they let me do. I remember it was like a 3000 word story on sex trafficking, a 3000 word story on, on anti-vaxxers, um, and a, a long, long stories, profiles on, on Trayvon Martin and on his family, on what was going on. So, I mean, there are, there were definitely short stories, but there were also, I, I think what I loved about USA Today is that there are also stories um, disseminated widely all over the country. It's the, it's the, it has the highest publication or the highest circulation last time I checked because um, it's in your hotels, it's in prisons, it's in all these sort of different places. It's not, it's cheap. So it's not like it's $7 on a Sunday. So I think it's probably the most accessible newspaper that I've ever worked for. And um, I, so I think that there was, there was a sort of merit. I also will say when I was there and I think I've been lucky throughout my career because I used to work for Newsday, which also had pretty short stories, that I always had editors that encouraged me, okay, but if your story's good enough, we will make the space. So yes, there were times where I was regularly writing 400 word stories, but then there were times where I would happen all upon a feature story and my news editors would say, yeah, give that 2000 words, we'll give it to you. So that's, I think, been really lucky. I would say PBS NewsHour is very much similar to the New York Times. Coming from the New York Times to PBS intellectually was not actually very hard at all because they have the same sensibilities. They have this, the New York Times takes its time on stories. So in some ways, if I think if you put the New York Times on TV, it probably looks a lot like the NewsHour. Oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Let, let's talk, if we can, about your coverage of the, the Trump administration, because of course, many of us remember very vividly the ways in which he, and again, I'm characterizing this, so you might see it a little differently, but I, the ways in which he attacked, I think, the, your line of questioning. Uh, I remember him calling it, and, and again, very legitimate questions that you asked. He called one of your questions nasty. I was wondering, can you describe what it was like to be on the receiving end of the president really personally, almost personally attacking you? And and, and how were you able to remain? Because I remember watching you on TV and thinking she remained so calm and professional in the face of this very um, demeaning kind of response from the president. And I would also argue misogynistic in, in, in many ways, right? I think the ways in which this president attacked women and, and, and women of color, it was, it was just disgusting, quite frankly. But I was wondering, how did you process all of that in real time? And what was it like for you then to become the news story? Because everybody then were, was talking about you as a reporter and how you were treated um, uh, during that period. I think that for me, um, it was about doing my job. And I, the way I say grounded was by thinking about just how terrifying the times were. So, you know, March, 2020, if we can think back to that time, people didn't know what this virus was particularly. They didn't know if it was airborne. We didn't know how many people were gonna die. We didn't know if we were gonna be able to get tests. We didn't know if we were gonna have enough ventilators as a country. I mean, those were the questions I was asking the president. They were like basic questions of like, will we get through this? So in some ways when people, you know, say, how did you remain calm? I thought to myself, well, people really need these answers. Like antics aside, I need to, I mean, I'm thinking for myself, I need to know, is my mother going to have a ventilator if she gets this virus, right? So to me, it, it, there was no time for sort of thinking about like, oh my God, what does this mean to, for me? Because I'm thinking I've interviewed, I, I, you know, the people that I interviewed, I was thinking about a young woman that I interviewed, four family members on ventilators at the same time. Someone else went to a funeral the, right, right around the same time. My family's at a funeral in March, 15 people in their family got COVID. People died because they, they, they weren't told that COVID was that serious. So to me, the, the, the seriousness of the times really grounded me because I really felt like the American, the American public really needs answers, like not antics, not back and forth. We need like basic answers. Like, are you going to be able to handle this? What are the scientists telling you? So to me, I think that that's one part of it was literally thinking, I rem I know that like I interview I, the thing I love about PBS and, and, and that I've been able to do at other, um, jobs is I've always still talked to regular people. I go to the White House, I do the White House lawn hits, but I'm always constantly talking to regular working class folks, whether it's my family, whether it's students who are talking about telling me about their student loan debt. I think about those same people when I'm at the White House all the time, because I think those people need answers and they deserve a professional press. 
the other thing I think is important to, to think about with this is I'm a black woman who's lived my life in, in a black woman's body for a long time. I venture to say every black person that has lived professionally has had a moment where someone has said something to you about yourself that you know not to be true, where someone has said something that you just know is completely out of whack, but you've remained professional. I would go on to say, probably if you're a woman of color, if you're a woman in general, if you're a human being in America, um, you probably have also had that same experience. I'm talking about my experience as a black woman because it's sort of the, the lens that I see the world through. But I imagine that if you're a white man or anybody, you've probably been in a meeting where someone said, you're stupid or that idea is stupid or they've downplayed sort of your contribution and you found a way to keep it together. That to me is the only kind of metaphor I can use for why I, and how I kept it together when the president was, going. I thought it was, it was, it was obviously sort of a, a microcosm of what I think is, everyday people's experiences. Mine happened to play out with millions of people watching with a president who's screaming and, and, and doing the most. But in reality, you probably have been in a board meeting or in a, in a classroom where some teacher said something about you that you were like, that's, that's not who I am. I, I know what I'm talking about. And you somehow figured out how to remain professional and go through. Maybe it's because you didn't want to lose your job or because you just needed to pass this test to graduate. Whatever it is, you, you found a way to stay cool and move on. Yeah. Yeah. But was it strange, though, being the, the news story? I mean, having people, other reporters talking about this um, during the night, the news, was that weird a little bit? I don't know if weird was, I don't know if weird is the right word. I mean, I think it was a bit surreal because, you know, as a journalist, you, you don't want to be the story. Um, so, but to me, it was, I mean, I, I think maybe it was probably a, a little surreal, but I can't say that I dwelled on it enough because I'm constantly thinking, like I'm constantly, especially in 2020, I mean, that year was so awful, right? Like it felt like Spinal Destination. I didn't have that much time to think back like, oh, everyone's talking about me. I can't believe everyone. I, I wasn't really spending that much time because I was either working and trying to get answers from the administration or I was talking to my family about kind of who's okay, who's the last person who got COVID. So to me, I feel like, you know, to be a working person in, in, in 2020 was both trying to balance family issues and missing people that you wanna see and also doing your job. So I didn't really spend that much time thinking about who was talking about those interactions. Can you take us into, I think those of us who are political chunkies were fascinated by this, take us into what it was like to cover day to day the White House. I mean, we remember Stephanie Grisham has a book out now. She was the press secretary, but she didn't hold a press briefing, right? You know, for, for many, many weeks or ever. I mean, so I was wondering what was it like to cover the White House at a time when the information was very, very controlled? Um, and, and what was that like um, on a day-to-day -day basis? Did it feel chaotic to, to you? It's interesting that you would say it was controlled. I think that it was the opposite. I think the information coming out of the White House was uncontrolled because the president was tweeting all day. Uh, okay. Stephanie Grisham, you know, now she's out doing interviews and she said, essentially said, I didn't want to do a briefing because I didn't want to have to lie on behalf of the president. And it's it's an interesting way to, to describe and to sort of explain why she never held a briefing, but you had a president who basically was his own press secretary, his own communications director. He was like, even if you heard something from the press secretary in a briefing, whenever they did end up having them, you had a president who would quickly come out and contradict things, who would quickly come out and, and make decrees by tweet. So in some ways it definitely felt chaotic. I think it's sort of how it felt to be an American in the, in the four years that Trump was in office, right? It was chaotic. You, you looked up and there was a news story almost every hour. Um, but in some ways, it also felt like this is exactly where I should be because this needs to be covered. Yeah, yeah. I want to get to some questions if we can. And so if you have a question, please uh, put it in the Q&A box uh, and I'll try to get to as many as possible. I was wondering, you know, one of the things we talk about in my classes is uh, this whole idea of being an objective reporter, right? What is objectivity? Um, and I was wondering, how do you how do you view that whole term objectivity? and whether or not you believe there is a role for advocacy journalism um, in, in, our, in our society today. I mean, I think there's a role for all sorts of voices. I mean, there have always been columnists, there have always been editorial boards who have been advocating for one cause or the no another. That's, obvious, that's, that's separate from, from what I've been doing as a journalist, but I think it's, um, it's, it definitely has its place, obviously, in, in the New York Times and so many other places. Um, you know, we have 
the biggest host on MSNBC, Rachel Maddow, she is definitely coming with a point of view, but she's also brilliant and also presents um, her point of view with, with, with real facts and real data. So I think in some ways, it's always going to be that sort of, uh, of, of lane for that. Um, I would say in, in, in terms of um, the role of objectivity in journalism, I think we have to just be real that journalists are people. They come with their own set of experiences. They come with their own set of, of what they think about some different subjects. I think the, the best thing we can be is fair and accurate. The best thing we can be is to recognize, okay, this is what I think about this, this, but I'm going to try my best to make sure I include perspectives, not just because it's sort of um, opposite of mine, but because it also makes sense and it also adds constructively to the public dialogue. So case in point, I think about the climate change debate, we don't need to have a debate over climate change. So I'm not bringing on a scientist who doesn't believe in climate change to debate a scientist that does because the scientist who does represents 99.9% .9 of scientists. So I feel like we, we should really tread lightly on the idea of what objectivity looks like. The same thing I would say about racism. I'm a journalist who thinks racism is wrong, who thinks people of color should be treated fairly and, and be treated just like everyone else. That's a point of view, but I don't think it's a controversial point of view because if you look at our constitution, it's the it was it's literally the ideals of our country that we have not lived up to, but they're still the ideals that we wanted to live up to to treat every man and woman equally. Um, so to me, I think you you just really have to work at making sure that you're being fair. So I've interviewed a whole lot of Trump supporters. I've interviewed a whole lot of Biden supporters or Bernie supporters, and I think that you can give people voice, but you also I think especially in these times where we're dealing with 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 misinformation and really disinformation we also have to be very very careful so you know when when we think about how we report on january 6th i'm not going to be on tv having someone you know argue with someone else about whether or not this was a tourist visit right like clearly january 6th was not a tourist visit clearly it was an insurrection people died there was property damage so there are over 650 arrests like that's not a tourist visit so yeah. i think that we just have to really be very careful about about how we incorporate sort of how we incorporate different sides um, and different points of view while also being really, really, um, I think, responsible with the way that we, that we present information. And what about just calling folks out on their lies, right? When they're just lying and not telling the truth, which we saw happen quite often, uh, I think under the, the Trump administration too, where there was just lies, you know, he was just lying. Is it the role of journalists to say, no, Mr. President, that's that's not true? That or is it to again present both sides? You know what I mean? When it's clearly just in factual, not factual. I mean, I think any most basic understandings of journalism is to under is to present accurate information. So there's a reason why there are fact checkers. There's a reason why you do research so that you put out information that is accurate. So yes, I think it's the role of journalists to definitely present the truth and to definitely say, oh yeah, that's that's not true. I mean, I think we saw that in real time. I if you if maybe some folks remember, I've I've fact checked. President President Trump in real time at times. I remember one inf incident that I think about. Um, he, I was, I had. I mean, one of the things that we have to also talk about is you have to really be doing your research. You have to really have your facts together if you're going to be trying to push back on people's lives. You can't come in sort of half thinking you know what happened when in reality you you actually don't have a good grasp on things. So during those press conferences, I will have I would have been reading for hours, doing my research, talking to people so that I knew what I was talking about. I knew so in some ways what the answers to some of my questions were before I posed them. Um, so there was one time where I was questioning President Trump and he was going after Nancy Pelosi for having some meeting or traveling. And I said, well, Mr. President, you have been traveling. You know, you've been at you. You've been not at the White House. And he said, I haven't, I haven't left the White House in months. And I'm like, really? It last in two the last two weeks ago, you were in North Carolina for a rally on this day and this day. And he kind of sat back and said, OK, you're right about that. But still, I think that those are the type of moments that really, I think, sort of crystallize the role that journalists should play. Same thing with the pandemic's office. So when that was probably one of my first sort of interactions during the pandemic, the president said, I took no responsibility, take no responsibility at all. And I said, well, you under your leadership, the pandemic's office was closed and people left this administration that were literally focused on making sure that pandemics were prevented. And he was like, I don't know anything about that. I'm like, yes, you do. And John Bolton knew about it and you guys talked about it and he sort of got upset. But again, it was like, we need to make sure and you need as a journalist to have your facts so that when you are fact checking someone, especially someone like President Trump, but there are a lot of politicians, a lot of local leaders, a lot of who knows, a lot of nonprofit or like there are a lot of people in the world that will try to mislead you in real time that will try to confuse you as a journalist. So it really you have to do your due diligence to know what you're talking about when you're doing an interview. Yeah.
So talk to me if we can, if you can, about social media. You know, um, obviously that has in many ways, I think, enhanced journalism. Um, you have a rather large following, I think like a million followers or so. And I was wondering, how do you view kind of Twitter and social media as a way of helping to tell the story, tell the narratives that you're trying to put forth? I always tell uh, people that just because you tweet doesn't necessarily make you a journalist, right? You know, people think you just can tweet and you're a journalist because there are some skills that we need to know and learn in order to, to do what we do. So I was just curious to know how have you found social media to be um, an aid or um, a tool rather that you can use uh, in the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, I think Twitter and social media in general has, has been critical. I get information from Twitter. I put out information on Twitter. I Last week, I broke a story that Daniel Foote, who was a special envoy for Haiti for the U.S., he was resigning. I broke that story on Twitter because it was the quickest way to get the information out there. We later put it up on a story and made it a story on our website. So I think that in some ways... Um, we have to really uh, embrace social media and also see its flaws. So, you know, there's, there is sometimes a lot of hate on social media, but I found it to be a really critical tool to journalism. Um, and, you know, when I think about, you know, people tweeting, I, I go back to Ferguson mm. and, and the idea that, you know, those people, especially those first people who were out in Ferguson, Missouri, who were tweeting about what was going on, who were tweeting about the crowds gathering, who were tweeting about Michael Brown's death. You, they might not call themselves journalists, but they were citizen journalists. They yeah. were journalists who were on the ground, who who could, you could not deny that something was happening in Ferguson, Missouri. And it took the national media a few days to catch up. So I think that in some ways, Ferguson to me is, is, is a good example of not looking down on people who are trying to report on their communities, even if it's Twitter, even if they don't have the classical training of journalists. In some some ways people know their communities they know what's going on they know when something's not right and i think as journalists we should be open to making sure we talk to those people we find those people we we report on with those people um and and we figure out what's going on ourselves but we can use we can use sort of citizen journalists and 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 as sort of journal people who are just sort of doing raw footage on a story um to guide us to what the actual story is no, I think that's a good point. And then certainly, if you think about George Floyd, of course, that the young lady who filmed, uh, again, the police officer with his knee on George Floyd's neck, uh, again, she wasn't a journalist, but again, she had gotten recognition later uh, from the Pulitzer Committee because of the, the, the ways in which her video really revolutionized and changed America for, you know, in, in many ways. I mean, we, you know, we many of us saw that video and, of course, uh, thanks to to her courage and, and her willingness to, to film that. So it was really important. I have some questions here. One is uh, from uh, Professor Helton that says, what are a few foundational communication skills you learned in your undergraduate studies that have helped your career in some way? You know, be afraid of making a mistake, I think has been really, really key. Um, you know, for me, I dot all my all my I's and cross all my T's. I ask people how to spell their name. I mean, it's the basics of you want to make sure your facts are right. It's really easy to get someone's name wrong or to get someone's age wrong. And that sort of can really, I think uh, it can really, it can be, there can be a domino effect there where you become a sloppy journalist if you don't get those real basics down. So getting, making sure you just understand sort of the fundamentals of trying to collect information and making sure you're presenting it in an accurate way. So making sure that you're fact checking yourself, that you're reading your stories over and over again. Um, when I'm publishing a story, especially I remember in the New York Times, I've gotten corrections before and I, I, I live in fear of a correction, right? Like I feel like I want, I don't want to have to be the person to raise my hand and say, I'm so sorry, but I, I spelled that senator's name wrong. So I think really sort of doing journalism afraid to make a mistake has really served me. Um, I think the other thing is to really listen. We sometimes as journalists sort of form what we think the story is. So we go into communities and we ask people about gun violence or we go into communities and we talk to people about healthcare when maybe the most important thing going on is that they have COVID or that it's it's the grocery store closed down. I think it really behooves journalists to, to try to ask people in some ways open-ended questions. I remember um, doing a, an interview with a guy um, in in Wisconsin. He was a Trump supporter. And I was asking about healthcare because I was doing this healthcare story. Story. And I was like, you know, why do you support President Trump's health care plans? What's going on? And he kind of was giving me sort of wayward answers, but he kept saying, you know, people think I'm racist. People think I'm racist. 
And I was like, okay, finally, like, why do people think you're racist? That's what you want to talk about. And he basically went on this whole sort of rant about how Black people don't like to work and look at you at the New York Times. You probably got this job because of affirmative action and just sort of went on and on on this sort of like rant about the way that he saw Black people. And his town was 98% Black. I mean, sorry, 98% white. And at one point he said, and you know, there are too many black people living here now, they're moving in. And I'm like, your town is 2% black. But he said, yeah, but before we only had like five and now we have like 15. So in some ways it was like, if you, if I hadn't really listened to what he was telling me, he wanted to tell me that President Trump for him, he signified a return to a sort of 1950s America where he didn't even have to see black coworkers, where he, where, and his idea of black people was being confirmed by the way that President Trump was talking about black people saying that we were, you know, living through hell and in rat infested areas. So in some ways it's like, if, if I had just kind of just said, okay, well this, this guy really supports Trump because of his healthcare, I would have missed the story. And the story was really, this is a guy who's living in a town who is, that is slowly, very, very slowly diversifying and he's pissed off about it. And he thinks that Donald Trump can fix that problem for him. Yeah, yeah, wow. Next question, what's the future of print journalism, um, newspapers? It seems like digital media has taken over. Um, do you have any observations uh, on that? That's a great question with, <laughs> that's a, a ginormous question. I would almost say, what's the future of journalism period, right? Are we gonna be hologramming into places? I have no idea where the technology goes. I do think that journalism will continue to follow the technology. I remember getting the first iPhone and writing my first story on it. And I was an intern at the Washington Post and my editors looked at me like I was crazy. They were like, you typed your whole story on your phone, like who does that? But it's because I was you know, 24 and had been texting my friends all throughout college on my new iPhone. And I felt completely comfortable filing a whole, you know, thousand word story on my phone because it was just what I was used to doing. So I think that the journalism will always catch up. I think for me, I hope that that print journalism has a really, really strong future. I, the New York Times seems to be on really solid ground, the Washington Post as well. And I'll say, I mean, I, I would also ask that question about local news. I mean, having got my start in that, in that weekly African-American newspaper, the West Side Gazette, and then having worked at the Miami Herald, which is my favorite local newspaper, um, you know, I subscribe and pay money to read local news. And I think that so many people don't. And I, I'm more, I'm, I'm in some ways less worried about the medium surviving and more worried about whether or not local news will survive in the way that it has been able to. Because when you lose local news, you lose people who are holding people accountable at a ground level. You think about Jeffrey Epstein, or you think about the, you know, the, the, the University of Pennsylvania sex scandal, the Sandusky scandal. You think about Larry Nasser in Indiana and, 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 and the local paper that, that broke that story on Larry Nasser. Um, you don't have sort of those stories break if you don't have local news and well-funded journalists who can make a living um, telling those stories. So I think local news is, is it's such uh, an important part uh, of our country it's, it's such an important part of how our democracy functions. And I think I probably spend more time worrying about that than whether or not the New York Times will survive versus TV. Yeah, yeah. What about the economic um, demographics, um, particularly those who watch like the news hour? Uh, a question here is, um, is there enough being done to target kind of more working class um, or low income kind of viewers in that way? Or is this you really, you know, the focus really towards kind of educated, upper educated folks. It's a really great question. That's not really my job. I probably would think that there's probably someone in the front office of, of PBS NewsHour who could talk about sort of the demographics of our viewers. What I'll say, say is that PBS is super accessible, right? We're not cable. My, my family members who don't have cable in Miami, they can turn on. I grew up watching PBS Kid when I didn't have cable. So for me, PBS is probably the most accessible um, medium. We're free on YouTube. There's no, you don't pay to watch the news hour. So in some ways, I, I, I really love the idea idea that you know Washington Week we are we are a nonprofit organization essentially we are we are there we are there creating content and creating a show for the public good so in my mind uh, I think we're as accessible as we can be maybe we could be doing better at targeting you know going into schools maybe even going into prisons like I said USA Today was probably the most accessible newspaper and I heard from prisoners I heard from from people in rural countries I heard from from you know people staying in hotels in New York City so to me, I feel like that's a model that 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 works. That it, it was just so accessible to so many different kinds of people. Um, but it's a, it's a good thought to have. Yeah. Uh, question: How have you dealt with situations 
in your profession where the story uh, or task that you were assigned might have conflicted with your values? Uh, have you ever had to deal with that? Or, or maybe conflict with editor an editor over the direction of your story? I'm lucky that my editors have really respected me and I have not felt conflicted with any values on any stories that I've had to do. Um, for example, I remember when I was covering the, the the death of Trayvon Martin, I was young. I was probably like 23, 24. I'm from Miami. I literally grew up across the street from one of the high schools where, where Trayvon went. I had cousins who went to high school with him. So I knew the area that Trayvon Martin had grown up to. I knew what had formed him and, and sort of and sort of who these people were. I was very familiar with the story. And I remember at one point, you know, there was this national debate about like, who is Trayvon Martin? Is he this troubled teen? He, look at the gold teeth he's wearing. Oh my my God, he might have smoked weed. And I had to really, I think, talk to my editors and say, well, I'm I'm from that area. Smoking weed and having gold teeth does not make you like it does not mean that you have to be murdered or, or, or killed on a sidewalk, right? Like this is not abnormal that this kid at 17 was smoking weed, maybe liked watching MMA and wrestling and maybe had some gold teeth. Like that's completely normal for what happens in Miami. Um, and I think that my editors really trusted me and, and we didn't vilify a teenager, a 17 year old, because you know people were people in par parts of the country are wondering if gold teeth were somehow a signifier of evilness. So I think that for me, I've gotten really lucky that the editors have, have looked at me, looked at my life, life experience and trusted me to tell the stories accurately. Yeah, yeah, a question, uh, another great question. As a black woman in broadcast journalism, have you experienced uh, sexism uh, at all in the, in the newsrooms where you've worked? I'm okay, I can't really say that I've experienced sexism. Uh, I mean, I've definitely had people tell me like, you, like, I don't know if you're gonna be confident enough. I don't know if you're pretty enough to be on TV. I mean, maybe that's what you would, people would call sexism. Um, I know that I've had male, I've had male colleagues who have been told, you know, you're too short to be on TV. So it's not as if only women get sort of um, get criticized for their looks. Medium is very much a TV is very much a visual medium, and there are definitely some bad actors who have an idea of what a TV journalist should look like, both male and female. Um, but you know, I, I would imagine that maybe that other people here, students uh, who are trying to get into TV, they might hear some of that, but. I would just say, you know, ignore the haters and keep moving. I, luckily for me, I grew up with a mother who, who instilled so much confidence in me that when someone, you know, says something to me that I know not to be true about myself, I just sort of keep it moving. Yeah. And then another question that's kind of related to that was uh, really around hair, um, you know, and this whole idea of whether or not, you know, uh, a journalist, a uh, Black journalist should straighten her hair um, is that the expectation or is society shifting and changing uh, in many ways where it's totally acceptable? I mean, obviously you, Joy and Reed with braids, I mean, it's not um, necessarily maybe an, uh, a real big issue today, but I was curious to know your insights about that. Yeah, I mean, I think you answered the question. You have me, you have Joy with braids and curls, you have me with my fro, you have Abby who wears her hair curly sometimes or wears straight hair you have, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of Whoopi Goldberg. She has her dreads on TV. I, I think Black women have have sort of always risen above what people think about our hair. I, I'm really good friends with Charlene hunter Gall. She's the first Black um, correspondent for NewsHour. She was rocking braids in the 70s and 80s on NewsHour. So I'm not doing anything that is sort of outside of the, of the history of what people look like on NewsHour. We've been lucky um, at NewsHour. And I would say, I, I'm thinking about ABC who had who had Michelle Martin on with her dreads. I think Black women have sort of showed up, especially thinking about Black women because of, the, of, again, sort of where I'm coming from. Black women have showed up and said, look, we, we can do the job and I'm going to do it looking like I, like I always look and people will have to deal and people have dealt. Yeah, yeah. I, I read that, um, that Gwen Eiffel was one of your mentors or you had a real connection uh, to her. And I was wondering, can you talk a little bit about what Gwen Eiffel has meant to you, of course, a pioneering uh, Black journalist who died in, I think, 2016, uh, but um, really sat in the seat, right, where you, you are uh, uh, sitting now. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I alluded, alluded to it a bit before, but for me, I've been really lucky to have mentors, both in my mother and my grandmother, strong Black women, Haitian-American, 
immigrants, um, but also in in women who um, I'm not related to who who took an interest in me. So Gwen Ifill was one of them. A lot of her friends, including a woman named Athelia Knight, who was a longtime Washington Post reporter. She was kind of, I call her my journalism mom. She introduced me to Gwen. Um, Michelle Norris is another one who was friends with Gwen, who has taken me under her wing. Nicole Hannah Jones, the creator of the 1619 Project over at the New York Times. She's a great mentor of mine and a friend of mine. I've been really lucky that, and I would, you know, I, I, could, I could mention the men like Tremaine Lee, who's a reporter at MSNBC. Um, I've been really lucky that I've been able to, to have really great mentors um, and, to, and to really sort of have people who were invested in my success. And that's meant a lot. And, and Gwen, you know, to, to, to be at Washington Week, to be in the, the, the moderator chair that Gwen held for, for so long um, is really touching it. And, and it means a lot to me. Yeah. Uh, question, do you, do you have a favorite story that you covered uh, throughout your career? I cannot pick. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I cannot pick one story. Uh, and question, can journalism be done part-time? Uh, can one be in another career and still do journalism? I mean, I would say yes. I mean, there are plenty of freelance journalists, right? Um, uh, can you talk about... Um, you know, that at all. I mean, did you ever work as a, I know you were an intern, but did you ever do freelance work? I never did freelance work. I don't know. I don't, so I don't really know the life of like journalism part-time. Um, the journalism of practice has sort of been all encompassing and is, has taken up all hours of my day. But I've, as you mentioned, there are a lot of freelance journalists out there. Um, journalism can be a hard place to make a living. Um, so there are people who have to go maybe be teachers or they're, or they're, you know, they're doing other things while being journalists. I know some of the economic journalists who were Wall Street bankers before they became full-time journalists, um, people who were doctors before they came, became full-time journalists. So I think there, you can definitely practice journalism part-time for sure. I think it just depends on sort of what you're doing in your free time. Yeah. We'll try to get in like two or three more quick questions. I went from our president, President McGuire. She said, some media seem to want the 2024 election race to start right now. Too early? Are they just addicted to the ways that Trump stirred up frenzy every day? <laughs> so I, mean, I, think it's a, I think it's an interesting question. I think 2024 started the minute 2020 ended. You, you see Republicans jockeying for to see who's going to be sort of the next GOP mantle holder. So I think in some ways it might seem too early, but you have to start watching the players, Nikki Haley and, and Ron DeSantis in New York and so many others, Texas, what's going on with Greg Abbott. I mean, we've been kind of covering, okay, here are all the different things happening in these states. But when you zoom out, in some ways it's like, who can be the most conservative to sort of, um, to sort of prove to their base that, that I can be sort of the person who takes over the mantle of Trump. And the same thing on the other side, I mean, Democrats, you really have to watch the Democratic base and watch President Biden's approval ratings because it tells you a little bit about how the Democratic base is feeling, what, what the Democrats need to be doing in order to win in 2022 and 2024. Yeah, yeah, but but there is still a possibility that Trump could be the nominee, right? In 2022. That's right. Yeah, okay. Here's a question from our provost. Uh, what advice would you give Trinity students who want to realize their professional aspirations? And, and then I guess a follow-up question would be from uh, an individual who says, when it comes to getting your foot in the door uh, as it relates to journalism, what are some of the what are some of the things that you think students uh, should be thinking about now? I would say the thing I would say is what I said before, which is find mentors who really care about you. Go after the people that are doing the thing that you want to do. So whether you're a teacher or a doctor or a Wall Street banker, go find people who are doing that. Um, and go find people who care about you enough to sort of invest time in, in helping you get to where they are. So I was lucky that I had a group of women journalists who really helped me, mentored me along the way, gave me advice, helped me navigate all sorts of things um, to, to get to where I wanted to go. Um, and I would say that you should just have a group of mentors. And, and that also means like, people that are your age. So, you know, we talk about mentors as being sort of veteran people, but for me, the people that have gotten me through a lot of difficult times have been my friends. So one of the things I always tell college students, the most important thing about college is to really nurture your relationships, your friends that you're making right now, try to make them lifelong friends, try to really keep in touch with the people who you're interacting with. They'll be the people that will be there when you're getting married, when you're getting your first job, when you, if you have to, if you get laid off, if something happens to you, like they'll, when you, when you, when you really struggle, you in some ways can be leaning on your Trinity sisters or Trinity brothers 
to help you out. So I think that that's critical. Um, and then and if you're in particular, if you're trying to get into journalism, I would just say be willing to go anywhere. You know, not Washington, D.C. is a great city. There are a lot of people who want to start their journalism career in D.C., but be willing. If the, if the first job you get is in New Mexico or is in California or is in Seattle, go get that job. The most important thing is to get reporting experience, get in a newsroom, get the experience, and then you can go wherever you want to. Yeah, no, that's great. That's certainly great advice. Yamish, thank you so much for, for joining us. This was a real treat for me. I think uh, our audience certainly learned uh, a lot about you and also about, again, how important the work that you do is. And so again, you have made us also very proud uh, in the work that you do every day. So thank you again for taking time to, to be with us. And again, to the audience, I want to remind you that on November 2nd, uh, we'll continue in our lecture series with Dr. Cornell West, who will be joining us. And again, we'll circulate that information uh, over the next couple of weeks. So thank you again. Uh, this was a great session. Appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.